All right, thank you all for joining us for our February 11th, uh, second day of our NVAC meeting for this month. Our next panel is uh, entitled Vaccine Safety. In this final panel for today, we'll review the COVID-19 vaccine safety data and hear a presentation from Dr. Grace Lee on context in vaccine safety, including challenges and opportunities and balancing risks and benefits of vaccination. Dr. Ann House from the CDC will also present COVID-19 vaccine safety updates from the primary series in children aged 5 to 11 years. And I'm going to kick us off with an update on the vaccine safety assessment from the COVID-19 vaccine safety technical work group to ACIP. Uh, and you have my slides up. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So the objective of the vaccine safety technical work group has been to review, evaluate, and interpret post-authorization and approval COVID-19 vaccine safety data, and to serve as a central hub for technical subject matter expertise from federal agencies conducting these safety monitoring processes, to advise on analyses, interpretation, and presentation of vaccine safety, and to provide updates to the COVID vaccine works group and the ACIP on COVID-19 vaccine safety. Next slide, please. We've continued to review COVID-19 vaccine safety data from passive and active surveillance systems from within the United States, primarily including VAERS, VSD, uh, as well as the FDA BEST system, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Indian Health Service, and the Departments of Defense. We've also received input from international partners, including the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, as well as our colleagues in Israel. And we've also uh, seen some special evaluations, including myocarditis case follow-up studies. Next slide, please. So from December 2020 through February uh, 11th of this year, we've had a lot of meetings, uh, as you see on the slide, 45 independent meetings, a dozen joint meetings with the COVID vaccine work group, and 16 ACIP meeting presentations or reports with the assessments of our subcommittee. Next slide, please. So what, have, what assessment updates have changed or, uh, or come up since our last presentation to NBAC back in September of this past year? We've had an update on the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine and TTS, discussions around mRNA vaccines and anaphylaxis, as well as myocarditis, talked about the safety of COVID-19 vaccine booster vaccination and the safety of COVID-19 vaccine in children five to 11. And I will comment that uh, my comments that I'll make on the children vaccines are a little older data than what uh, Ann House is gonna be presenting to you shortly. Next slide, please. So the first issue that uh, fits into this group is around the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine and the TTS, the thrombosis, the thrombocytopenia syndrome. The initial review of six cases of uh, central venous sinus thrombosis and thrombocytopenia by VAST was in April of 2021. Through August of 2021, there were 54 cases and nine deaths reported in the United States. The TTS case reporting rate following the Janssen vaccination was higher than in previous estimates in men as well as in women and across a wider age range. Follow-up investigations provided more evidence for a relationship between the vaccination and TTS and associated severe outcomes. And our committee recognized the public health benefits of the vaccine. However, the concern uh, was raised over the additional cases and reported deaths. We felt that this new data on risk needed to put in contact with, in the context of benefit risk assessment. This was presented to the ACIP COVID-19 vaccine work group and to ACIP. And that's when they made their uh, recommendation to be more preferential of mRNA vaccine uh, back in December. Next slide, please. Anaphylaxis uh, following mRNA vaccines were identified uh, very early on in December of 2020. We've had uh, discussions about safety data and vast assessments uh, early in 2021. The CDC and FDA recommended some risk mitigation strategies, including screening for risk prior to vaccination, monitoring for symptoms post-vaccination, early recognition and management of anaphylaxis on site, as well as provider and patient education by CDC and partners. Anaphylaxis was reviewed again in August 2021 for the Pfizer BLA, and again in the last month for the Moderna BLA. There's been no substantial change in the benefit-risk balance with these risk mitigation 
strategies for this very uncommon uh, phenomenon. Next slide, please. We've had extensive discussions around myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. This was initially identified in May 2021, and the CDC issued clinical guidance for myocarditis and pericarditis following messenger RNA vaccines in May. Data was presented to VRPAC uh, in June, uh, on June 10th of last year, and the data and the vast assessment presented at the ACIP meetings on June 23rd and was followed by the MMWR publication. EUA fact sheets were revised with a warning added in June 25th of last year, and the FDA approval of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine in August of 2021, including information on myocarditis, pericarditis, and the package insert. And similar uh, notation in January 31 with the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine uh, approval and information in the package insert for the Moderna vaccine. Next slide, please. This gives some uh, data on the reporting rates in VAERS. Uh, this is rate reporting rates that uh, exceed the background incidence are highlighted. Um, in males, we saw reporting rates exceeding background after dose one at ages 18 to 39, after dose two at ages 18 to 49, and in women only after dose two in those 18 to 29 years of age. Next slide, please. This is a, a slide with slightly older data re showing reporting rates for myocarditis per million doses administered after the Pfizer vaccine, the seven day risk intervals for our younger population ages 5 to 11, up to 16 to 17. In this group, uh, there were over 37 million doses of uh, dose one and dose two administered to these age groups. And again, reporting rates exceeded the background incidence in the peach shaded cells for males after dose one for ages 12 to 15 and 16 to 17, after dose two for all age groups, and in females after dose two for age 12 to 15 and 16 to 17. And the reporting rates among males are substantially lower among age 5 to 11, as opposed to 12 to 15 and 16 to 17 year olds. Next slide, please. In VSD, we uh, looked at rates of confirmed myocarditis, pericarditis in the seven day risk interval among 18 to 39 year olds, comparing with events in the vaccinated comparators. And this shows the data for the Moderna vaccination uh, and uh, the adjusted rate ratios. Next slide, please. So thinking about myocarditis, myocarditis outcomes following vaccination, in VAERS, there were 359 reports meeting the case definition among individuals over 18 in the first seven days post-vaccination. 94% of these uh, uh, young people were hospitalized and 69% had recovered from symptoms at the time the VAERS report was made. There were follow-up surveys of myocarditis in, the, in cases in VAERS. 360 patients interviewed within over 90 days of follow-up. 92% of those uh, were hospitalized. 380 providers of these patients were contacted, and over 80% were fully or probably fully recovered by the time uh, of the follow-up phone call. In VSD, following Moderna vaccination, there were 38 chart-confirmed cases among individuals 18 to 39. 79% were hospitalized, 75% of those for two days or less, and 100% of those patients were discharged to home. Next slide, please. So the vast assessment of myocarditis was that the data available to date shows an association of myocarditis with the messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccination in, adult, in adolescents and young adults. The risk is low overall, but is highest in adolescent and young adult males following dose two more than dose one. The data continue to show that post COVID-19 vaccination myocarditis appears clinically mild. More data are being accumulated and analyzed to further evaluate myocarditis clinical course and risk. But at the present time, our committee did not suggest new safety concerns regarding messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccines among these young people beyond those previously identified. Next slide, please. So looking at uh, safety data around COVID-19 booster vaccination in VAERS, there have been almost 26 million messenger RNA vaccine booster doses and 334,000 Janssen booster doses administered. Among those, we had 11,900 VAERS report, 
with over 93% non-serious. Almost half of the VAERS report were among persons age 65 and older, and the most frequently reported non-serious adverse events were similar to the adverse events reported after earlier doses of the vaccine. There were 54 preliminary reports of myocarditis, all after messenger RNA uh, vaccine. 12 were verified at meeting the CDC case definition and 38 pending investigation at the time of uh, the data lock on this review. And the age distribution reflected the booster dose recommendations. Next slide, please. Safety data after booster doses uh, in vSafe. Uh, there were 725,000, almost 726,000 vSafe participants. Most reported a primary messenger RNA vaccine series, followed by a booster from the same manufacturer. For both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccination, local and systemic reactions and health impacts were reported less frequently following the booster dose than following dose two of the primary series. And Moderna booster did appear to be more reactogenic than the Pfizer BioNTech booster regardless of the initial vaccine series. Next slide, please. We also received a report of the data from the Israeli Ministry of Health on third doses of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Booster doses of this vaccine were phased in in Israel, first for persons 60 and older, and since the end of August 2021, for everyone 12 years of age and older was eligible for a third dose. Over about 3.9 million third doses administered to persons over 12 through November 15th, the rates of reported systemic, local, neurologic, allergic, and other reactions were lower than after dose, or lower after dose three than after either the first or the second dose, and rates of myocarditis were lower than after the second dose. Next slide, please. So the vast assessment on COVID-19 booster vaccination the data regarding booster doses to date are reassuring. Reactogenicity and adverse events of special interest are similar to or lower than those seen after the primary series. The myocarditis risk after a Pfizer booster dose appears lower than after dose two. And limited data available to assess myocarditis risk after the Moderna booster dose, lower than the primary dose. The deaths reported to VAERS after a primary series or booster do not suggest any concerning pattern. And actually, the reporting rates were below background rates. And VAST will continue to review further safety data regarding the booster doses to collaborate with our global vaccine safety colleagues and to provide updates uh, as we review this data. Next slide, please. And finally, reviewing safety data on COVID-19 vaccination in children 5 to 11 years. As of December 9th, over 7.1 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine were administered. In vSafe, most of the reported reactions were mild to moderate, occurred on the day of vaccination, with a similar reporting rate to that seen in the clinical trials. In VAERS, there were 3,233 reports to VAERS among children aged 5 to 11, with 14 reports of myocarditis, and eight of which met the CDC working case definition. The VSD continuing their near real-time sequential or weekly monitoring as of December 14, over 333,000 doses were administered, with 226,000 for dose one and 107,000 of dose two. There were no confirmed reports of myocarditis in the seven-day or 21-day risk interval. Next slide, please. The vast assessment uh, was that the data regarding vaccination in children five to 11 years old are reassuring. Reactogenicity and adverse events of special interest appear similar or less frequent than in older children and that we will continue to monitor and provide further feedback as we review these data. Next slide, please. So the next steps for our VAST committee are to continue to review data from our national safety monitoring systems and the manufacturer post-marketing requirements. We're gonna to continue to review real-time monitoring of vaccine safety as vaccination efforts expand to younger age groups, booster doses, and new vaccines. We're going to continue our collaboration across U.S. federal agencies regarding vaccine safety, as well as collaborating with our global vaccine safety colleagues on key issues that, impi that impact our risk benefit, benefit risk balance of these vaccines. And we'll continue to provide updates to the COVID-19 vaccine working group, to ACIP, and to NVAC at future meetings. And if you'll go to my last slide, please. And I want to thank uh, my co-chair uh, with Kip Talbot from ACIP, as well as all of our VAST members 
the CDC co-leads, Lori Markowitz and Melinda Wharton, and our many ex officio and liaison representatives, as well as our administrative support from CDC. Uh, this has been a, a lot of work, but, uh, but very important efforts. And with that, uh, I will stop and uh, hand the uh, gavel over to Ann House from the Centers for Disease Control to talk about uh, vaccine safety updates around the primary series in children five to 11. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? You are loud and clear, Anne. All right. Next slide. This is my disclaimer. Next slide. So today I'll present an update on safety monitoring data for primary series of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine among children ages 5 to 11 years. COVID-19 vaccines are being administered under the most intensive vaccine safety monitoring effort in U.S. history. And today I'll focus on data from two complementary systems, VAERS and VSAFE. I'll also touch on strategies to encourage participation in VSAFE. Next slide. So I'll start with data from VAERS. Next slide. The Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, serves as an early warning system for vaccine safety. It's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Next slide. Anyone can submit a VAERS report regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event. The key strengths of VAERS include rapid detection of safety issues and detection of rare adverse events. Limitations of VAERS include that it's a passive surveillance system that relies on voluntary reporting, has inconsistent quality and completeness of information, reporting biases, and importantly, cannot determine causality of adverse events. Next slide. As of February 6, 2022, after administration of nearly 15 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine, there have been 6,564 reports of errors among children ages five to 11 years. The median age was eight years and 46% of reports were her male. 97% of reports were non-serious, and this is similar to what we've observed for COVID-19 vaccines overall and other vaccines in general. Next slide. Race or ethnicity was unknown or incomplete for 35% of reports, and 34% were from persons who identified as non-Hispanic white. Next slide. So the table on the left lists the top 10 non-serious adverse events reported to VAERS. This includes those that are non-clinical, like product preparation issues. The table on the right lists the top 10 non-serious clinical outcomes reported to VAERS. So the non-clinical events bolded in blue in the table on the left have been removed for the table on the right. The most commonly reported non-serious adverse events were related to vaccine administration. This age group was the first to receive a smaller dosage of mRNA that is recommended for than that that is recommended for persons 12 years of age and older. And so administration errors are not unexpected. Most reports of administration errors often mention that there was no adverse event. Common clinical outcomes included expected systemic reactions to mRNA vaccine and syncope, which is not uncommon among children and adolescents after any vaccination. Next slide. So similar to the previous slide, this table on the left lists the top 10 serious adverse events reported to VAERS. And the table on the right lists the top 10 serious clinical outcomes. Per federal law, serious reports include reports of hospitalization, prolongation of existing hospitalization, life-threatening condition, permanent disability, congenital deformity or birth defect, or death. The clinical outcomes listed here reflect known, previously observed adverse events and signs and symptoms consistent with myocarditis. Next slide. 14 reports of myocarditis were verified to meet the CDC case definition. The median age was nine years and median time to onset was three days. There were three reports after dose one and 10 reports after dose two. 10 reports were for males and four reports were for females. All children have been discharged home and at last follow-up 
10 had recovered and four were still recovering. No children were reported as receiving an adult dose of vaccine. After nearly 15 million doses administered, the reporting rate for myocarditis in this age group is less than one case per 1 million doses administered. Next slide. To summarize, most reports to VAERS among children ages 5 to 11 years were non-serious. The distribution by sex, race, and ethnicity is consistent with other age groups. The most frequently reported adverse events were non-serious and well-characterized events associated with Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccination or consistent with myocarditis. 14 reports of myocarditis were verified to meet CDC case definition. Similar to older age groups, there was a male predominance and most reports were after just two. CDC will continue to monitor COVID-19 vaccine safety among this age group and follow up on reports of myocarditis symptoms. Next slide. So now I'll review data from vSafe. Next slide. vSafe is a voluntary smartphone-based safety surveillance system that allows a parent or guardian to enroll their child after any dose of COVID-19 vaccine. vSafe health surveys are sent daily during the week following each dose of vaccine and include questions about local injection site and systemic reactions and health impacts, including inability to perform normal daily activities, inability to attend school, and receipt of medical care. Additional health surveys are sent weekly through six weeks after vaccination, and then at three, six, and 12 months after vaccination. Parents can add a child to their account and complete surveys on their behalf even if the parent did not participate in VSAFE themselves. Next slide. As of February 6, 2022, Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccination had been reported for over 48,000 children ages five to 11 years. Approximately half were female, 82% identified as non-Hispanic and 72% as white. Next slide. This figure shows the frequency of reactions and health impact events reported at least once during days zero through seven after Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination by dose. Dose one is shown in orange and dose two in blue. In general, reactions and health impacts were more frequently reported following dose two than dose one. Next slide. This figure shows the frequency of any systemic reaction reporting during days zero through seven after dose one and dose two of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination with days since vaccination on the x-axis. For both dose one and dose two, reactions were transient and most frequently reported the day following vaccination. Next slide. To summarize, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination has been reported for over 48,000 children ages five to 11 years. The distribution by sex, race, and ethnicity is consistent with other age groups. Reactions were generally mild to moderate and most frequently reported the day after vaccination. Reactions were more frequently reported after dose two than dose one. These data are subject to a couple of limitations. vSafe is a voluntary system and as such is likely not completely representative of the vaccinated US population. In addition, data following dose wasn't yet available for 20% of participants. Next slide. So now I'll briefly discuss encouraging vSafe participation among parents. Next slide. There are currently about 10 million vSafe participants. At the beginning of vaccine rollout, vSafe participation included approximately 20% of vaccinees, and this has decreased over time. For children ages 5 to 11 and 12 to 15 years, participation is about 1%. We're hoping to promote vSafe participation in anticipation of recommendations for children ages 6 months to 4 years. Next slide. There are a few ways to promote vSafe to parents and to patients. You can verbally direct parents to go to vSafe.cdc.gov or provide a vSafe information sheet. Ideally, for the vaccination of young children, this should occur before vaccination. There are also informational vSafe posters that are available, and these printouts, both the informational sheet 
and the poster are available at the link listed below. Next slide. I'd like to thank the many people who made the analysis of this data possible, including those who report adverse events of errors and those who participate in BSAFE. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Grace Lee from Stanford University, who's also the chair of the ACIP. Dr. Lee, your slide's up and you have the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Hopkins. Um, I first want to thank the committee for their work in this arena and also to Dr. Hopkins in particular for his leadership of this committee um, and for his leadership of our ACIP COVID-19 vaccine safety technical work group that has been reviewing all of this data. Um, I, I just want, I forgot to add a disclosure slides, but I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest other than my role in ACIP and any opinions expressed today are my own personal opinions. Next slide. I wanted to go through how we understand vaccine safety using three different lenses. Uh, first, through the lens of monitoring data in our vaccine safety surveillance systems. Second, through the lens of defining vaccine safety as the balance of benefits and risks at the individual level. And then finally, through the lens of country-specific vaccine policies and the balance of benefits and risks um, at the population level. Um, and all of this is really meant to just highlight the challenges we all know we have in communicating what vaccine safety means to the public. Next slide. COVID-19 vaccine safety surveillance um, has been the most intensive surveillance process I've witnessed in the last 20 years of working in the vaccine space. Um, and I do actually want to acknowledge the important work of NVAC and NVPO um, in setting up the processes uh, and many of the systems that uh, continue today. Uh, those were originally set up during the H1N1 vaccine safety monitoring experience, and that really set the foundation for how we approached vaccine safety for COVID-19 vaccines um, as early as um, June 2020. Uh, in the U.S., we're monitoring vaccine safety, as Dr. Hopkins mentioned, using multiple surveillance systems um, and multiple approaches. Uh, the ones listed here are adapted from a table that was published previously in some presentations uh, that, that are most active right now. So enhanced passive surveillance, active surveillance using a survey-based approach, such as vSafe, a claims-based approach, and an EHR-based approach. Um, and we also happen to have a like really robust national clinical consultation program that I have very much appreciated over the course of the past year and a half. Um, I want to highlight here the challenge of monitoring data from so many different systems with unique populations and different capabilities. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think the other important aspect of this slide is that, uh, you know, to take a moment of uh, recognition for all of our federal agencies and their um, investigators uh, for their incredible collegiality and partnership to create this safety ecosystem for the U.S., uh, I believe this has actually set a new bar for us for what is possible um, uh, during uh, and what we can achieve during a pandemic and I hope during interpandemic times. Uh, this table also does not reflect the um, international partnerships that Dr. Hopkins mentioned that have really uh, been strengthened um, by the sharing of these safety data between countries. Next slide. In the context of vaccine communication, I did want to provide some thoughts about the current ecosystem. So first, the unique population characteristics of each system can be both a strength and a challenge, depending on how vaccine recommendations roll out. So, for example, early in the pandemic, uh, we had focused on you know, the elderly, essential personnel, and those with high-risk medical conditions. And some systems um, in the entire ecosystem are better at capturing certain populations, uh, but perhaps not others. Um, second, the differences in the data types, the population size, vaccine capture, and outcome definitions mean that findings may differ. Um, and again, this can be incredibly helpful because the consistency of findings across systems and populations using similar definitions and study designs, I think, uh, create an important part of our understanding of whether or not a signal is real. Uh, but it can be a challenge to communicate why different systems are showing different things. Third, we have a challenge explaining that all signals are not real. Um, safety signals always require further refinement and evaluation. And in addition, uh, we want to balance uh, 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 subsequent evaluation with the need to communicate safety findings in a timely manner. Um, but communicating uncertainty has been a challenge for all of us throughout this pandemic, and uh, communicating too early or too late can lead to unintended consequences. Um, 
For the last two points, I think I just want to highlight the difficult work that our vaccine safety teams have really embraced and had to carry on their backs throughout this pandemic. And we have really asked them to continuously adapt their work and move in different directions to accommodate new requests. Um, such as longitudinal follow-up for vaccine safety in pregnant women and myocarditis in teens and young adults. Um, and we've also asked them to keep up with continuously evolving recommendations, many of which we uh, had not anticipated prior to this pandemic or these safety systems being stood up. Next slide. Um, so next, uh, in thinking about vaccine safety as a balance of benefits and risks, uh, we know that national discussions about benefit risk balance often focus on the benefits of preventing deaths, uh, hospitalizations, symptomatic infection um, due to COVID-19, and that the risks are typically ones like rare serious adverse events after vaccine or common um, adverse events after vaccination. Um, as specific adverse events such as myocarditis are highlighted, however, um, what we've noted is the lack of corresponding specificity about how um, uh, about benefits, and that can hamper our ability to communicate effectively with patients. So um, mRNA vaccines, you know, may be associated with myocarditis, as Dr. Hopkins uh, presented, um, but they can also prevent cases of myocarditis caused by COVID-19 infection. And in this example published by Barda et al. In, um, out of Israel, in this population-based cohort, the risk ratios for myocarditis were 3.2 after vaccination, and 18.3 after SARS-CoV-2 infection, with risk differences of um, 2.7 events per 100,000. we lost the microphone, I think. Uh, okay, hold on. Is that better, Dr. Hopkins? You're back, yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so uh, just pointing out that it's it's really important to hone in on what those benefits are and sometimes um, describing uh, benefits as hospitalization or symptomatic disease maybe has less meaning uh, to an individual that's uh, thinking about whether or not what, what the risk of myocarditis is after infection versus what the risk of myocarditis is after vaccination. And if you'll move to the next slide, please. And so this slide shows the uh, relative rates of a wide range of adverse events following vaccination in the blue uh, and infection following infection, COVID-19 infection in the orange. Um, and that's on the left. And on the right, you'll see a corresponding uh, figure with risk differences, again, from the same paper. Um, so what I found really compelling about these data is the substantial protective effect of vaccines with respect to adverse events, such as acute kidney injury, intracranial hemorrhage, and anemia. And probably this was because infection was prevented. Uh, furthermore, uh, persons with SARS-CoV-2 infection appear to be at substantially higher risk for arrhythmia, myocardial infarction, deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, intracerebral hemorrhage, thrombocytopenia, than those who received the um, uh, vaccine. Um, so the key to comparing these risks really depends on the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection to an individual person. Um, and we recognize that that risk can vary according to place and over time. Um, but given the current state of the pandemic, you know, the risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2 uh, appears to be inevitable. <laughs> Next slide. So uh, vaccine policies by country. Next slide, please. Um, in data presented to the ACIP on February 4th, we saw that the myocarditis rates reported in different countries after second dose vaccine in males tended to be 1.5 to five times higher for Moderna rather than uh, versus Pfizer um, with those uh, differences uh, noted across countries. Next slide. And then based on these data and also based on the timing of authorization, we've seen different policy responses in different countries with a preferential recommendation in some countries, but notably it differs by age group and even by gender and other countries have not given a preferential recommendation. Um, so the variability in response may you know, reflect several country-specific factors, such as different risk estimates generated by the different safety systems in their countries, differences in COVID-19 burden between countries, the timing of availability of certain products, and then the differences in risk perceptions, as well as the broader policy response, um, including other mitigation measures that are not vaccine-related uh, to COVID-19. 
but this can certainly add to public confusion about um, how different countries interpolate, interpret population level of benefit and risk. Next slide. And in another example presented at the ACIP meeting on February 4th, we saw examples of potential um, differences in effectiveness and safety by dosing interval for the primary series for mRNA vaccines that were presented from different countries as well. Next slide. Um, and these data have also led to differences in whether or not uh, to recommend alternate intervals and what that ultimate, uh, optimal alternate interval might be. Um, interestingly, many of these interval changes were initially driven by limited supply and country-specific allocation policies, um, uh, but that also provided informative data. Um, what also contributed to uh, perhaps differences in these policies, I'm speculating, but I, I am guessing that some of this might be the phase of the pandemic in different countries at different times, and when that decision-making happens, um, it can influence recommendations if you're in the middle of a surge versus an inter-surge period. And um, all of this can lead to uh, implementation and communication challenges given the varying preferences and approaches used by different countries. Next slide. My last slide. So in brief, uh, vaccine safety, you know, means different things to different people. So it's really important to understand in which context you're having these discussions. Um, in some discussions, we're focusing only on risk assessment. In others, we're considering vaccine safety as the balance of benefits and risks with a recognition that it can change over time. And then with vaccine policy and decision making, um, in addition to acknowledging the differences in context in which a decision is being made, you know, I, I think that there's this added layer of um, sort of judgment uh, that people make on whether or not to err on the side of omission versus commission. Um, and this can go in either direction. So, you know, some people may feel a vaccine recommendation could potentially harm some individuals and that doing nothing is better, uh, while others perceive that a particular vaccine, or others may perceive that not recommending a vaccine could harm individuals and that doing nothing is worse. Um, so depending on, uh, you know, what that context is, both uh, in terms of the country, the data, and the individual decision maker, that can all influence a set of recommendations. So communicating about vaccine safety continues to challenge many of us. And, you know, I, I started to think about this in three questions. I'm not sure these are the right three questions, but, uh, you know, it's, it's starting to think for me about <laughs> what I need to answer. Um, so first, is it time to act? The second question is, what is the best option right now, recognizing it might change in the future? And if it does change, why did it change in explaining that? And then finally, how can we better explain policy decisions in context um, to ensure that the intended impact is achieved, which is really to maximize the health of our populations um, and to minimize the amount of confusion that can sometimes ensue when recommendations do change over time. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, uh, well stated as always. Uh, we now have uh, a little time for discussion. Are there any questions or comments uh, from uh, those on the call? Uh, Hannah al Sali, you have your hand up. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins, and thank you to the panelists for the informative uh, presentations. My question is to Dr. House, uh, and it pertains to the rash observed in children uh, on the verse VERS uh, system. Was there a particular pattern of rash, or uh, it was just heterogeneous uh, group of rashes? So I think you're referring to the VAERS data that I showed that was a non-serious report. Status. It was non-serious, yes. Okay. So VAERS is a tricky system, and the way that we collect that data, I, I can't really describe in great detail what those rashes were. It's, it's probably a pretty heterogeneous population, if I had to guess, without taking a deep dive into that data. Okay, and nothing was uh, detected uh, in VSAFE, a particular pattern. No, um, a rash is actually very rarely reported to VSAFE in the week following vaccination. It's one of the least frequent uh, adverse events that we see reported. Uh, 
I don't think I have that data on this presentation, but it is in the MMWR that we published on five to 11 year olds. All right, thank you. Uh, giving other folks a, a chance to ask questions or comments, uh, Rob Schechter. Uh, Rob, you certainly get to speak as you've been with us through this vast journey also. Bob, can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, my apologies for the mic problems before the break. Um, I just wanted to introduce the additional nuance uh, in the last, in Dr. Lee's slide set of comparing the, the risk estimates with incorporating the severity data on myocarditis that you, you introduced, Bob. And so in thinking about what the apples to apples comparison is, is one myocarditis case after immunization, how does that compare to a myocarditis with, with uh, after COVID-19 disease um, as, a, as a, another nuance or twist to the, to the comparison? Thanks for um, pointing that out, Rob. I think um, that is really, it, it is about trying to compare apples to apples and it feels like we're comparing apples to oranges and I think that continues to be the challenge. Um, so anything that we can do to help support uh, individuals and in understanding risks and benefits, I think is meaningful. John Douglas, get your hand up. Uh, yeah, a really good panel. I had a question for Dr. Lee. Um, the uh, Adverse event specific comparisons between vaccinated and unvaccinated is a really uh, uh, tantalizing approach. And I'm wondering whether or not you think this is something we ought to, frankly, make a somewhat more routine. And I'm thinking about, you know, the various pieces of vaccine disinformation that come out. They're often around specific things. And, I mean, myocarditis is one, but any, any reflections on more routinizing that sort of approach? Um, yes, I'll just give my personal opinion. <laughs> so uh, I certainly think that there would be um, much benefit. I think, you know, prior to this with other vaccine preventable diseases, it hasn't felt as uh, um, critical. And I think with COVID-19, it's my understanding of thinking about vaccine safety surveillance has changed entirely. Um, so I do feel like after this COVID-19 experience, it may be worth considering sort of a priori uh, you know, hoping there's not a next pandemic, but continuing to um, think and evolve our vaccine safety methods and approaches would be really meaningful. I think the other continued challenge, and I'll, um, you know, state this here that I, I think most people uh, understand and agree with, is that, you know, continued um, inter-pandemic support of many of our uh, safety and effectiveness systems uh, can wane as interest wanes over time. Um, but, ensuring that the data and the capabilities are there to be able to respond in real time are so critical uh, for all of us. So my, my largest hope is that, um, as you were mentioning, we could take this as a lesson learned. We could use this to invest in what we need to do um, as systems and actually sort of uh, aligning and bringing the vaccine safety and effectiveness systems together potentially uh, where possible. Um, and then thinking about meaning, making these meaningful comparisons so that when we're trying to explain this to patients, it feels um, more salient or more uh, relevant to them. That and, and having more transparent uh, data on baseline rates and that type of thing so that every person that passes away, it's not immediately assumed that it's from the vaccine. Thank you. Rebecca, you have your hand up. I do. And I just want to say, I really appreciate the series of presentations this afternoon. And this is a very non-IIS question to ask, but I'm just curious um, if anybody can mention the thoughts behind communicating with parents, should a booster dose become available at, excuse me, and recommended for this age group for any of the, the children that were in the group of a non-serious adverse event, you know, what's the thought to communicating with them that, you know, we're sorry this happened. This really isn't something that is serious in the grand scheme of things. We highly recommend that you consider uh, a booster dose for the, for your child. Um, because I do think while we might think it's not serious, there are a lot of parents that will think it's serious. And so there's a real gap between medical and, and, and parenting. Maybe that's the way to phrase it. Thank you. I expect Grace probably balances her head against this one as often as I do. You know, trying to acknowledge that 
if your child had a fever or a rash or a swollen lymph node that scared you and scared the child and, and uh, got everybody revved up, acknowledging that that happened, acknowledging that those events do occur and that we take them seriously, but at the same time, how do we frame that as important but not a barrier to getting another dose of the vaccine because we want to prevent you being that child that ends up in the ICU or on the ventilator at that time. It, that, that messaging really, in my view, boils down as much as anything to relationship and having a discussion um, because if you don't do that, you're perceived as minimized. Yeah, and I'll just uh, maybe augment um, Bob's comments. I, I agree with Bob as always. Um, I, you know, I, I think we talk, well, so we hear a lot about concerns about long-term safety. We don't talk at all about the long-term effects of infection, uh, which is known as PASC, and we don't have a good understanding of the frequency in which that happens. Um, I also think the other thing that we tend to do, especially with children, is to compare everything to adults. And to me, that doesn't make any sense. You know, uh, at one of the CDC meetings, it was presented that for um, the five to 11 year old population, COVID-19 is the eighth leading cause of death. Um, so clearly death is not as common in children as it is in older adults. Um, yet uh, we as a system seem to place a value on children that is different. Um, and I actually think what we want to do is focus in on what's important in preventing in children of that age group, recognizing that death is a rare thing, which is good, uh, but there's lots that we can do to prevent it. And then the final thing I'll say <laughs> is that, um, you know, I think that we also um, don't acknowledge that symptomatic infection can be significant to individuals. Um, and so being able to uh, better understand, describe, and um, uh, sort of articulate what the actual impact is to individuals and their families, I feel like we can continue to do better at that. Um, and I hope we will. All right, well, I wanna thank uh, my co-members of, uh, of my panel uh, for their participation. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, as always, Dr. House, as always, thank you so much for your, your time and contributions to this committee. It's now time for us to turn to our federal agency and liaison representative uh, updates. Uh, we're going to start with our liaison uh, member reports uh, and start with uh, ACCV. Good afternoon. This is Mary Rubin, and I will be giving the updates for the Advisory Commission on Childhood Vaccines. The Advisory Commission on Childhood Vaccines, ACCV, conducted its 119th quarterly meeting by Zoom on December 2, 2021. The meeting began with program updates from the Division of Injury Compensation Program, the ICP, and the Department of Justice. The ACCV also received program updates from the Immunization Safety Office, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV. AIDS policy. Ms. Kane, ACCV Vice Chair, discussed the importance of ongoing research into vaccine safety, including accessing and using, this, using data from the CDC's vaccine safety data link. Following her discussion, Ms. Kane asked for a vote to form a work group to discuss this issue and make recommendations to the ACCV. A brief discussion among the ACCV members clarified the purpose and procedures for forming a work group and four members requ requested more time to review the materials and draft the work group mission statement that Ms. Kane has distributed. The ACCV will discuss and vote whether or not to form the work group at the March 2022 meeting. That ends my update. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Uh, Aim. Um, hi, good afternoon. This is Claire Hannon from the Association of Immunization Managers. Um, I submitted a pretty lengthy um, written report, so I'll just highlight a few things um, that we're doing at AIM. Um, January marks the beginning of the legislative season in many states and jurisdictions, and we found that there were over 490-something legislative proposals last year relating to vaccines and immunization. Um, so we've created a legislative roundup um, and really looking to share resources, talking points, and other um, helpful things for program managers um, to see what's happening legislatively across the country. Uh, we've held listening sessions um, for COVID vaccine rollout 5 to 11-year-olds and talked about 
the lessons learned with enrolling providers, messaging to parents, um, and getting the vaccine out in order to prepare for potential rollout of the vaccine to under five-year-olds. Uh, we have an upcoming video for HPV Awareness Day, March 4th, 2022, and we'll be promoting the benefits of HPV vaccine in our video and circulating that to all of our partners and, and stakeholders, um, circulating it widely to get the message out. And lastly, I wanted to mention that we have been partnering with the National Association of School Nurses, and we had um, a special supplement published um, based on our work with them, school located vaccination clinics in the era of COVID-19. And this was offering findings on the school located vaccine environment, as well as tools to help school nurses and immunization programs implement school located vaccine clinics. Um, I will stop there and thank you for the opportunity to give the update. Thank you very much, Claire. Is there a report from ARA? Yes, good afternoon. This is Rebecca Coyle providing the update for ERA. Um, I, I will start off by just mentioning the smart health cards that has come up in, in prior discussions today. Um, in our report, we just outlined sort of what they are, um, links to more information on that. But then we also developed an information sheet on what smart health cards are and what they are not. Um, this is really a resource that's designed for uh, policymakers, decision makers, that are trying to best understand whether or not they should implement something like this, um, either with their IIS or, or in other locations. Um, I also wanted to provide an update on clinical trial data. I think um, throughout the pandemic, the need to capture clinical trial data has become uh, very clear that for those that participated, there's a need to put that information in the IIS so that it can be part of their long-term immunization record. Um, up until recently, there has not been a way to um, very easily distinguish between a clinical trial vaccine and a, um, a, a, or a licensed or EUA vaccine. And we now have guidance that outlines how that can be submitted to an IIS so that it indicates that it is a clinical trial vaccine. And I think all this to say, it's, it's really to help improve the long-term outcomes. And I think for um, clinicians and others that are looking at someone's uh, vaccine history, this is a really important piece to note. Um, I also provide an update on our measurement and improvement activities. And then um, one of the areas that we are working in, it's the immunization integration program, which is a collaboration with CDC, HIMSS, and ERA to really look at pulling all of the different stakeholders from across the um, data exchange spectrum together to tackle key issues. In the presentation I gave earlier, I talked about um, bulk queries and just wanted to note that this group, the IIP Collaborative, is tackling using bulk queries to access IIS data from a, a holistic perspective. So looking at the role of IIS, looking at the role of EHRs, and sort of what the behaviors ought to be um, across the board. Um, and then I think I'll just close out by saying we have some new initiatives underway within the organization related to data use. Uh, we have been utilizing our, a, a work group uh, to, uh, for those that are using, um, well, now we're extending out to, to Power BI so that folks that have um, users of Power BI and need to use it for vaccine data and using IIS, this is a, a group that will be beneficial across the board for that. So that I will close and say thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, APHA. Yes, hi, Bob. This is Kelly Good. I'll be giving the report on behalf of the American Pharmacists Association. Um, just a reminder, the American Pharmacists Association is the largest pharmacy organization with over 65,000 members. So you have a re written report. I just want to highlight a couple areas. So the American Pharmacists Association continues to be active in engagement. They have a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control around vaccine confidence. In the re written report, you have a link to multiple video testimonials um, that are helping to support pharmacist activities to build vaccine confidence. The second area is training and education. So we continue to offer webinars post ACIP meetings to provide education and training for pharmacists as well as in the area of COVID-19. 
We've developed a COVID-19 vaccine algorithm. It's a practice tool to help determine patient eligibility timing for COVID vaccines for primary additional and or booster doses. And lastly, just to um, recognize that the pharmacy providers are really going over and beyond to meet the healthcare needs of individuals and communities during COVID-19. Similar to other healthcare settings, there are shortages of staff and resources, increased workload and public demand, and continuous changes in recommendations has increased some of the concerns from pharmacy providers and team members regarding ability to, to continue to meet patient needs. But we really appreciate the support of NVAC, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Kelly. Next is Asto. Uh, good afternoon. This is Kim Martin, and I will be providing the updates on behalf of Asto. Uh, we continue to assist our members, the state and territorial health officials, in response to and recovery from COVID. And we have posted several new resources on our brand new redesigned website that was launched yesterday. Um, I think I mentioned last time we conducted virtual meetings in 10 states aimed at convening state health equity leaders, immunization program managers, and community stakeholders, and a report along with some infographics to describe key actions to improve immunization uptake is now available on our website. We are currently also working to reduce disparities in adult immunization programs by working with key partner organizations. In the upcoming year, we plan to fund uh, some communities with low adult vaccination rates and high levels of racial and ethnic disparities to implement project-based strategies to improve immunization uptake. And uh, last year, uh, we worked in coordination with CDC to provide full-time disability and preparedness specialists in 17 jurisdictions. We have a new report outlining the thoughts of these 17 specialists on why those with disabilities may be hesitant to receive COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and we also have some great PSAs and briefs available as well. And finally, uh, we have developed a short brief outlining practical strategies to improve trust, communication, and advance policies as a result of a meeting that we had to identify approaches to improve partnerships between communities and state and territorial health departments. Again, all of these new resources can be found on our new redesigned website at asto.org. And with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to provide an update. Thank you, Kim. Nacho. Hi, this is Amy Franson. Um, I will be providing the update for Nacho. Um, as with the others, we've submitted quite a lengthy report, so I'll just highlight a few of the resources that we have lately. Um, through our Local Public Health Initiatives to Increase Vaccine Confidence Project, Nacho developed the Vaccine Confidence Health Equity Action Lab. Um, and this is a training based on tools and resources developed by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and is an adaptable model that uses a set of activities to bring together a diverse group of community stakeholders to take action in pursuit of equity and vaccine uptake. Um, through our Supporting Local Health Departments to Increase Vaccine Uptake project, uh, we've partnered with the National Rural Health Association and done two webinars on supporting rural local health departments to increase vaccine uptake. Um, and as part of this project, NRHA developed a COVID-19 vaccines resources for rural health departments um, fact sheet, which is a document a compilation of tools and resources to help rural local health departments address many of their specific questions and concerns that are applicable to rural communities. Um, on January 31st, NACHO hosted the SARS-CoV-2 Vaccines Information Equity and Demand Creation Project, or COVID, webinar. And this event provided a guided introduction to the materials and tools developed by the COVID project, which is a consortium bringing together academic, nonprofit, for-profit organizations to increase COVID vaccine uptake in vulnerable populations. Um, and NATO will be hosting the 2022 Preparedness Summit, theme of reimagining preparedness in the era of COVID-19 on April 4th through 7th in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, during this summit, participants will be able to reflect on lessons learned from the current and previous responses, highlight tools, resources, and learnings that we can apply to the future 
um, and registration for that is now open at preparednesssummit.org. Um, and additionally, NATO is hosting its annual NATO 360 conference on July 19th through 21st, also in Atlanta. Um, the theme is looking to the future, reshaping the public health system. Um, and we'll explore how local public health workforce and its stakeholders can move forward in the midst of the ongoing crisis while implementing traditional and innovative approaches to restructure the system. Um, built to protect the health of communities and registration for that is also open at natoannual.org. Um, all these resources can be found on our website as well as linked in the larger report. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Erin Henry here, Executive uh, Director for Immunization Programs. Um, Canada continues to to be a global leader in COVID-19 vaccine coverage with 88.6% of our eligible population five years and over having received at least one dose of the vaccine and 83.5% fully vaccinated as of yesterday, February 10th. Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic evolves, the Government of Canada's domestic focus is to continue with our pediatric immunization and COVID-19 booster rollout. Approximately 55% of Canadian children aged 5 to 11 have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and approximately 22% are currently fully vaccinated. Among the Canadian population eligible for a booster 18 years of age and older, 52% have received an additional dose, while those over 70 years of age have achieved the highest coverage at 81%. Four COVID-19 vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Janssen are currently approved for use in Canada. Novavax and Medicago's COVID-19 vaccines remain under regulatory review by Health Canada, but are expected to be authorized in the coming weeks. Canada is also looking forward to receiving submissions for vaccine manufacturers for children under the age of five. Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI, um, has been very busy as your ASIP has been, and they've currently, currently released um, guidance on off-label recommendation use for boosters in adolescents 12 to 17 years old, who may be at high risk for severe COVID-19 outcomes, as well as suggested intervals between previous COVID-19 infection and vaccination, as many Canadians find themselves in this situation given the current Omicron wave. Looking to the future, the Public Health Agency of Canada and our broader health portfolio are considering how to adapt vaccine rollout and pandemic response efforts um, as COVID-19 um, continues. In addition, Canada believes it will be important to focus on ensuring individuals are up to date with their routine vaccinations to prevent future outbreaks of other vaccine preventable diseases. We know that many of our public health resources were pulled away from our routine programs to focus on the ongoing pandemic response and catch up programs will be required as a result. We are very grateful for the opportunity to hear from our US counterparts who are also thinking through similar challenges um, which will, of course, uh, inform our approach going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Verpak. Thank you, Dr. Bob Hopkins. Uh, so Verpak was busy in the last uh, six months since uh, we met at NVAC. Uh, there was a total of four meetings uh, in September 2021. Uh, the Verpak met uh, with the topic being the Pfizer-BioNTech Supplemental BLA for the Comirnaty COVID-19 vaccine for administration of a third dose or booster dose in individuals 16 years of age and older. During the meeting, the committee deliberated the findings uh, from real-world effectiveness data along with the safety data from the sponsor and voted against an, a supplemental BLA. The committee deemed the data compatible with an EUA of a booster dose at least six months after the series in individuals 65 years of age or older, those younger uh, but at risk for severe COVID-19, and those who are younger, uh, who's infrequent, who have frequent institutional or occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2, which puts them at higher risk of serious complication of COVID-19, including severe COVID-19. 
On September the 30th, the committee met again for uh, two topics. Uh, here, the first topic was an overview of the research program in the Laboratory of Bacterial Polysaccharides, Division of Bacterial, Parasitic, and Allergenic Products at the Center for Biologics uh, Evaluation and uh, Research. And the topic two was to select the strains uh, to be included in the influenza virus vaccine for the 2021-2022 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. Uh, the data review resulted in the committee recommending changes to two strains compared to the previous season, namely the influenza AH1N1, pandemic O9 like and the H3N2 like viruses. October 14th and 15th, the committee met again for two topics. The first topics was to uh, deliberate the emergency use authorization of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine for administration of an additional dose following the completion of a primary series in individuals 18 years of age or older. The committee voted in favor of an EUA of a third dose, um, uh, which was 50 microgram. Uh, six months or more after the initial uh, vaccine regimen completion for the following populations, uh, individuals 65 years of age and older, individuals 18 to 64 years at risk of severe COVID, or 18 to 64 years at high risk of frequent SARS-CoV-2 exposure due to institutional or occupational background. The second topic of the meeting was also the emergency use authorization of the Janssen Biotech Incorporated COVID-19 vaccine for the administration of an additional dose or booster dose in individuals 18 years of age and older. The committee voted in favor of an EUA of a booster dose in individuals 18 years uh, or older at least two months after a single dose of the uh, Janssen product. October 26, the committee met to discuss the Pfizer uh, request to amend its emergency use authorization to allow for the use of the product, the Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 vaccine, in, in children 5 to 11 years of age. The committee reviewed the data and voted in favor of the EUA for a two-dose series at 10 microgram each dose, three weeks apart, in children uh, 5 to 11 years of age. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And I understand the VRPAC meeting uh, for next week has been delayed. Is that correct? Uh, I am recused from the covid uh, from the, I am recused from the COVID-19 uh, deliberations at, at VRPAC because I do a lot of COVID research. So, but my understanding is that's um, the case. So I, I just read it on the news like you. All right, thank you. Um, and I understand we do not have a report from AHIP. Uh, we'll now turn to our ex officios, uh, Barda. Yes, Dr. Hopkins, thank you so much. This is Linda Lambert. I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary and MCM Support Services Director, and I'm standing in for our BARDA Director, Dr. Gary Dispro. So uh, BARDA also submitted a detailed written report on the efforts that we are supporting in collaboration with our interagency partners in the Department of Defense for the advanced development or procurement of six different COVID-19 uh, vaccines. We continue to support and collaborate with our colleagues on the administration's um, international donations of COVID vaccines. And um, like our other colleagues, we are also preparing and standing by for the upcoming VRPAC meeting when it is scheduled to um, make sure that we're ready to do our part in the, um, should there be an, an authorization for the rollout of the um, vaccine in children between six months and five years of age. Uh, the report also includes detailed updates on the status of BARDA projects for Ebola, smallpox, anthrax, Zika, and pandemic influenza, as well as the status of our efforts for needle-free vaccine delivery. So the last thing I will mention is that we just launched a new update of our BARDA website, so you can navigate pretty easily through that site to find out all that we are supporting for medical countermeasures 
for COVID-19 and other threat areas. Um, and that's my report. And I thank you, sir. And um, I pass. Thank you very much, Linda. CDC. Melinda, are you on with us? I see her on. I'm going to try and get in touch with her and um, maybe move on to the next person. All right. I'll go, let's go ahead and go to CMS and we'll come back to CDC. Hi, this is Mary Beth Hans, and I will um, share three updates from CMS. The first is really breaking news because we just in the last half hour updated our Medicaid vaccine toolkit, um, which is available on Medicaid.gov. So that was not in the update that I shared yesterday, um, a written update, but I'm happy to add that in so that the information gets added into the record. Um, I have two additional updates to share, both of which are in our written report. Um, one is that on December 2nd, 2021, we announced that state, Medi state Medicaid agencies are now required to cover vaccine counseling visits where a vaccine is not administered for most children enrolled in Medicaid who are up to age 21. Um, and this is under the early and periodic screening diagnostic and treatment benefit. Um, CMS will now consider certain COVID-19 vaccine counseling visits for children and youth to be covered um, to be COVID-19 vaccine administration for which state expenditures can be federally matched at 100% federal match um, through the last day of the first quarter that begins one year after the end of the COVID-19 public health emergency under the American Rescue Plan. Um, in addition, in December, um, we issued the federal fiscal year 2020 Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance um, Program or CHIP Child and Adult um, Corset Chart Packs. These chart packs provide summarizations of state reporting on health care furnished to children and adults enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP and primarily reflect care provided in 2019. So in most cases, it's prior to the public health emergency. Um, the chart packs include reporting on immunization quality measures. And um, in, the links to that information is included in our, re in our report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Beth. Next, CDC, uh, Melinda. Okay, can you hear me now? I hear you. I must have messed up your link. You're good. No, no, I, I think it was the double, the dreaded double muting. Um, uh, so we also submitted a written report and I just want to highlight uh, two items. One, a late breaker um, that did not make it into the written report and, and then highlight uh, one particular uh, challenge. Uh, so since I believe there's no one here from the um, US Department of Agriculture today, um, I will share that on February 9th, the USDA confirmed high path avian influenza in a commercial turkey block in Indiana. This follows detection of high path avian influenza H5N1 viruses in wild birds in recent weeks. Um, the detection of these viruses in poultry does not change the risk to the general public's health, which CDC uh, considers to be low. However, outbreaks in domestic poultry, in addition to infections in whale birds, may result in increased exposures in some groups of people, particularly poultry workers. So, of course, uh, that, that is of concern. Uh, secondly, I want to highlight the issue of the ongoing challenges of decreased routine vaccine coverage, uh, going back to the beginning of the public health emergency at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, uh, this has been, um, as other speakers have noted, really a, a problem worldwide uh, during the pandemic. Uh, CDC has frequently reported on the declines we're seeing in orders of vaccines other than influenza vaccine for the Vaccines for Children program. Uh, which we can monitor in a very timely way since these are vaccines that we purchase and distribute. Um, the uh, cumulative reduction going back to the beginning of 2020 uh, 
continues to be more than 12 million doses. Uh, although we don't have uh, within our system such good visibility on it, uh, there, it's also indisputable that vaccines for adults were impacted as well and uh, may be even more challenging to address. Uh, since the pandemic began, CDC has issued multiple calls to action with recommended actions that partners can take. And of course, CDC and other partners have created communications materials um, to raise awareness about this and facilitate communication to both um, uh, healthcare providers, other partners, and patients and their families. Uh, it continues to be a, a large challenge for public health and for healthcare providers uh, to, to expend, uh, to, to really invest a focused effort on this given the ongoing COVID vaccination program. And um, so I would like to take this opportunity um, talking to um, this group of uh, very well connected and committed vaccine advocates to encourage all the organizations, partners and stakeholders here at this meeting to identify what their organization or health system can do to implement effective actions to get both children and adults to a vaccine provider to receive any vaccines that are due or overdue uh, that were missed uh, since this public health crisis began. Um, it's you know, the accomplishments that collectively we've made together in the COVID vaccination program are extraordinary, um, but it's also important that we uh, don't lose ground on, um, on other preventive measures, including routine vaccination. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Hobson. Thank you, Melinda. I can't agree more about uh, trying to catch up. Uh, our next uh, is DOD. Yes. Uh this is David Hernsher. I'm uh, the DOD representative from the Defense Health Agency Immunization Healthcare Division. Uh, just to, I have three topics on my uh, official statement. The, our COVID-19 efforts, also speaking about tick-borne encephalitis vaccine, and then our, opera, our contributions to Operation Allies Welcome. So the, um, as of the 1st of February, 2022, the DOD has administered 6.8 million doses of FDA-approved or authorized COVID-19 vaccine, and we've done that in 400, approximately 400 immunization sites globally. And at least we can say for our active duty service members, they're 91% vaccinated. We, our, our other health care encompasses uh, U.S. Coast Guard, the uh, uh, Reserve and National Guard personnel, in addition to retirees who are entitled to care under the Department of Defense system. We also had the opportunity to capture FAIRS events um, and then further analyze them through um, our, um, our connection with our healthcare record system and direct contact with patients. And we continue to do, uh, do that as an ongoing investigation of, of vaccine adverse events, uh, plus a 24-7 um, uh, immunization-related uh, support center call uh, operation where we answer questions regarding to this. Uh, and Dr. Hopkins, we are happy to continue to work in the vast work group as we uh, uh, work through the vaccines, uh, our observations of, of uh, the effects of the COVID-19 vaccine and our special patient population that gets a lot of other vaccines as part of the requirement as being an active duty service member. Specifics about tick-borne encephalitis, we're, uh, uh, we're very excited about the opportunity for implementing this vaccine for beneficiaries who either live or service members who get deployed to countries where there is a risk of exposure and we look forward to the um, ACIP discussions that will occur later this month in regard to implementing this specific vaccine. And then finally, uh, in, uh, at the U.S. Uh, United States uh, Safe Haven locations, we've been very involved uh, with the um, support of the medical needs for Afghan families that were uh, relocated as part of Operation Allies Welcome which includes routine immunizations. And we are working now as that uh, uh, program reaches its completion to make sure that none of those vaccines that were acquired specifically for that operation 
go to waste uh, in any way. So uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. Thank you very much, David. And, and we certainly appreciate the collaboration with DOD and our vast efforts uh, over yes, this sir. last year. Uh, Thank next, you. Uh, next ex officio is HRSA. Good afternoon, this is Mary Rubin, and I will be providing updates for the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, BIPIC, and also the Division of Injured Compensation Programs. Um, first, for the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, um, we did submit uh, written updates, and I will highlight um, some updates, and there was um, there are numbers that have been recently updated since we, we made our, we submitted our written updates, which I will also um, give to, to the committee. Um, in a written form, but um, in terms of COVID-19 vac vaccine updates, as of January 28, 2022, a total of 8,218,816 um, COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered through the Health Center COVID-19 vaccine program, 76% to racial and or ethnic minorities. Um, the co the health centers are also working um, to provide vaccines to special populations and also to increase adolescent um, vaccinations um, for, uh, for, with COVID-19 vaccines. And in terms of non-COVID-19 um, news, the health centers um, administered seasonal flu shots to 4,538,024 patients. And health centers also administered select immunization doses to 3,041,586 patients for hepatitis A, hemopolis influenza B, pneumococcal, DTAP, DTP, DT, MMR, poliovirus, varicella, and hepatitis B. And so that ends the update for um, Bureau of Primary Healthcare. And in terms of the Division of Injury Compensation Programs uh, activities, um, again, a written comment was, um, a written um, update was provided and just highlight this, that um, the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Programs continues to process an increased number of claims. In fiscal year 2022, as of January 1, petitioners filed 245 claims with BICP and nearly 53.8 million was awarded to petitioners including their attorney's fees and costs. In addition, as of January 18, 2021, BICP has a backlog of 1,482 claims alleging vaccine injury awaiting review. As far as the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, or um, CICP, as of December 1, 2021, 5,630 claims alleging injuries or deaths from COVID-19 countermeasures have been filed with the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program including 2,969 claims alleging injuries from COVID-19 vaccines. Approximately 148 claims are in medical re review. And that ends my updates. Mary, thank you very much. Uh, you also do, you do such a lion's share of these reports for us. Uh, IHS. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Luzo Chukuma, and thank you for the opportunity to report on the Indian Health Service Immunization Activity. A full report of the IHS activities was submitted, but I'll provide some highlights, starting with our COVID vaccine activity. The Indian Health Service continues to maintain our COVID vaccine task force um, that was initiated in September of 2020 in response to the agency-wide allocation, distribution, and administration of COVID-19 vaccine within the Indian Health Service operated facilities, the tribal health programs, and urban Indian organizations. As of February 2nd, 2020, the IHS data included within the CDC COVID tracker reports about 2.7 million COVID vaccines that's distributed within the IHS Indian Health Service operated facilities, tribal health programs, and urban Indian organizations that chose IHS for vaccine distribution. The CDC tracker reports um, of the 2.1 million total estimated population to be served by these facilities enrolled through IHS, 51% has received at least one dose, 40.4% um, are fully vaccinated, and 27.9% of those fully vaccinated have received a booster dose. Additionally, the uh, vaccine task force through the IHS Office of Information Technology 
added staffing resource to support updating our electronic health record vaccine forecasting capabilities to implement the HCIP recommended additional dose for immunocompromised persons and booster doses for the recommended age, ages and intervals. The IHS Vaccine Task Force also promotes COVID-19 vaccine safety among AIAN uh, via three systems, the uh, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, the IHS Safety Tracking and Response uh, System, which is known as ISTAR, um, as well as routinely monitoring surveys from participating IHS Vaccine Sentinel sites. With respect to non-COVID immunization efforts, the IHS continues routinely to track pediatric immunization coverage. Long-term trends indic indicate a decline in immunization coverage for our two-year-old children, um, with a further decrease in coverage observed since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. In response to the decline in childhood immunization coverage, the IHS implemented a pediatric immunization improvement initiative called the Safeguard Our Future, Protect Tomorrow, Vaccinate Today. And this was extended from May 2021 through October 2021. The IHS facilities that participated in the immunization improvement initiative, such as the Warm Spring Service Unit um, in the IHS area, uh, Portland area, incorporated these activities into their routine clinical practice. Prior to the pediatric initiative, the IHS national immunization coverage for the 431331 uh, vaccine series among uh, two year olds was at 57% in the second quarter of fiscal year 2021. The immunization coverage for the two year old vaccine series increased slightly to 57.8% by the end of the fourth quarter of fiscal year of 2021. The IHS also continues um, is also planning to leverage the COVID vaccine strategies for the efficient implementation of uh, the new 20 uh, valent pneumococcal vaccine recommendations that ex uh, the expanded Zoster vaccine in immunocompromised individuals 19 and older and the expanded hepatitis B vaccine recommendation that was endorsed by ACIP in 2021. This ends my summary and thank you for the opportunity to present IHS activity. Thank you very much, Uzo. Uh, and our next report is from VA. Hi, everybody. I'm Troy Knighton, VA's National Seasonal Influenza Program Manager. Um, the VA continues to promote vaccination and prevention for both COVID and flu vaccines, as well as other preventive services and vaccinations. Since this past August, we've vaccinated about 1.55 million veterans within VA facilities with about 40% of those receiving an enhanced vaccine flu formulation. While this year's uptake is higher than last year's flu season, it's lower than pre-COVID flu seasons. About 46,000 veterans have been vaccinated through our community partnerships programs by retailers and other providers in their own communities. And as of this month, approximately 4 million veterans have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, with about 1.5 million of those receiving a booster. VA has also provided vaccination to our healthcare personnel employees of some other federal agencies, and also caregivers and spouses of veterans through the Save Lives Act. And that's it for VA. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much, Troy. Uh, and I understand we do not have reports from AHRQ, FDA, or NIH at this time. Well, I want to thank all of our federal agency and liaison representatives for their updates, uh, both written as well as uh, highlighted here today. We've now reached uh, our time for our public comment uh, today. Uh, I will note that there was one written public comment that's been shared with the members by Ann uh, early in the day. I understand we also have uh, one public comment on the phone. Uh, Teresa Rangham, are you uh, uh, on? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Teresa, you're loud and clear. Please proceed. Thank you. My name is Teresa Rangham. I'm the Executive Director for the National Vaccine Information Center. 
We were founded by parents of vaccine injured children and are a charitable nonprofit celebrating its 40th year in vaccine safety advocacy. I wanted to comment today with just a suggestion of um, when VAERS and VSAFE data are reported, if there could be a consideration to speak to um, how VSAFE data will or will not be incorporated into VAERS data. It would be beneficial from a public standpoint um, in terms of uh, public trust and transparency to integrate uh, the VSAFE data with regard to COVID-19 vaccines into VAERS data so the public has access to this data. I would also like to provide comment with regard to concerns that many of our supporters who are vaccinated, unvaccinated, and um, selectively vaccinated express with regard to um, IIS systems and EHRs there's an overall concern with regard to privacy. While public health, the conversation here is centered around public health, there doesn't seem to be a check and balance to patient concerns and the fact that this is sensitive medical data belonging to individuals. There needs to be a more patient-centered conversation and particularly where IIS systems are involved um, and the use of that data to even perhaps limit movements in society of individuals who have chosen or cannot be vaccinated. People are concerned about how this data is used. It stigmatizes and traumatizes this minority of people who make these choices. I would really advocate for conversations around allowing patients and individuals to choose who and when and how data is shared outside of a public health emergency, and that there be careful crafting around how it is shared when there is a public health emergency. These used to be conversations between patients and their doctors, and now it's become big data that no one has any control over and how it is shared. And that people are automatically opted in. So while there are benefits to data sharing, there should be some respect paid to the individual to whom that data belongs. I appreciate the opportunity to give comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Uh, we have now reached the uh, close of our second day of our February 2022 NVAC meeting. I want to thank uh, all of my, the members uh, for their participation over this last two days. We've had some great discussions around a number of very enlightening and thought-provoking uh, panels and presentations. Hope you all have a good weekend, uh, are safe and healthy with uh, your families, and look forward to seeing you at our June meeting. Uh, with that, uh, I will close uh, the meeting. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.